Bonjour, Kwe Kwe. Buenos dias, todos, todas. Bonjour. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, on va commencer. On a un panel avec trois personnes. Comme Colin l'a dit, on a, il nous manque encore des présentateurs. On va inverser euh, la première et la deuxième présentation. Alors sans plus attendre, uh, without uh, further waiting, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Andrew uh, Andrey. Um, on his paper on biodiversity, ecosystem services, and sustainability. Andrew and all the other ones will have uh, 12 minutes. I'll be sitting in front of you, and I'll have um, papers indicating you the remaining time. So 12 minutes, and I'll be uh, uh, timing very, very closely. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. <clears throat> uh, Okay, so what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you about the program that I coordinate, which interacts with Cicada and hopefully will be an important collaborator with Cicada and with some of the other initiatives that people have in the room. Uh, I'm the director of the program, and Felipe, who went off to find our missing panelists, uh, is the coordinator for the program. And of course, what that means is that I wrote the grant and got the money, and then I go to sleep, whereas <laughs> the coordinator gets there, you know, rolls up the sleeves and gets the work done. So if you really want to get something accomplished in collaboration with Bess, make sure you talk to Felipe because he's the man. Now, I, I think that in order for you to understand um, my own perspective, I need to just tell you, give you one slide about what I do because it's quite different from what most other folks do. So my own research is, um, can generally be first classified as natural sciences. I, do, I don't work in the social sciences at all, but the program in which, that I coordinate has an important social science component. In particular, I'm a biologist and I work on a general area called eco-evolutionary dynamics, which is really about how ecology and evolution work together in shaping biodiversity, ecosystem services, and sustainability. So that's the program that we coordinate. It's called BESS for short. Everything has to have an acronym, and so we have BESS. And it stands for those three particular concepts. And we have, uh, we're, we're very new, but we of course have a social media presence now. So if anyone wants to follow what's going on in the program, there are the ways to do so. Now, in order to tell you what we hope to accomplish with BESS in this brand new program, I have to tell you about the, the previous program that basically spawned BESS. Because by telling you how that program works, you can have a rough indication of how BESS will work, only that BESS has a lot more money than the previous program did. So that program was called NEO, which is, stands for the Neotropical Environment Graduate Option. And it was a partnership between McGill University and the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, which is mainly a biological research institute, but includes other natural and social science components. And here, of course, is Panama with a number of the field stations at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Now this program, NEO, it's a graduate training program was the brainchild of Katrin Potman, who is here, of course. And the uh, stated goal of the program was to seek to cultivate a broader understanding of tropical environmental issues and the development of skills relevant to working in the neotropics. So the pro program is focused on these particular elements, specifically in the neotropics, with an emphasis in Panama, with the main initial collaborator being STRI, the Smithsonian Institute there. Now, this program has been around for 15 years now, and the first enrollment was in 2001. So what I want to do now is tell you a bit about this graduate program. As I said, it forms a bit of a model for what we're doing next. Now, this program uh, is mainly, mainly a natural sciences program. So people study biodiversity, they study sustainability, they study environmental um, components of the environment. And some of those students do so in a social, uh, social science perspective. But the primary focus tends to be, up to this point, on natural sciences, mm -hmm. primarily because that's where most of the funding has been able to come from. Now, it uh, was originally a McGill-based program, so there were a number of different departments and faculties that were part of this program, and they're listed here. And the social science components are primarily uh, in political science and anthropology. Now, over the years, we've had a number of directors. So Ishmael Vaccaro um, over there was director for a few years. Katrin was director. 
I've been director in two different stints, and our new director is Brian Leung, who is, studies invasion biology in the biology department at McGill University. We also had a, a participation of a large number of STRI scientists who come up to McGill and become uh, adjunct faculty in various departments at McGill. Now, the core of the project, of course, is the students that have been trained in the project. And so here's just a selection of some of the earlier students in the program and some of them with the various components of their research that they've done. Now, in order to explain basically one of the other key elements of the program, which is capacity building, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a statistics on the students that we've trained so far, not by way of trying to justify our program to you, as I might if I were giving a presentation to some dean at the university, but rather as a way of representing the scope of the program and the sorts of things that we do in the frequencies with which we do them. So up to this point, we've graduated a total of 47 students, including 12 PhD students in the NEO program. And you can see the distribution of those students across the different programs. The primary component is the biology department, partly because of funding. That's where most of the uh, funding has come from or been associated with. And partly because most of the STRI scientists are associated with biology. However, we do have fairly reasonable representation across most of the other departments. And um, we've also extended our collaborations in Panama and the rest of Latin America to include many other institutions and organizations. So STRI was the original partnership with McGill, but we uh, look much broader than just STRI. We also look to uh, other Latin American institutions. Now, our current students in the program are even more skewed toward biology uh, and towards PhD students. So last I looked, there were 24 students in the program. 18 of which were PhD students, and the primary in, in biology. So you can see that the, the, the goal and the focus to try and make sure we have an integrated approach to these environmental issues in the neotropics, which would include a social science component, uh, is difficult for us to achieve without additional funding, which is why the program that we have now called BESS will hopefully strengthen that component. Now, I did want to mention that um, one of the primary goals of NEO and now BESS is capacity training of, Latin Ameri of young Latin American scientists who will then hopefully go uh, and obtain positions in Latin America at either research institutions or government agencies or NGOs or even businesses. So initially, you can see that we graduated mostly Canadian students, but you have representations from many other countries. And now you can see we have a smaller component of Canadian students and many more students from Latin America. As uh, has been pointed out to me, there's a typo in one of the country names on here. See if you, I'll give you some bonus points later if you can tell me what it is. Okay, so that was NEO. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a lot of funding for additional work within this program. And to do so, we went to the NSERC Canada, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, and we pitched to their CREATE program, which is collaborative research and training environment or something like that. We pitched this program to them as a way of training Canadians and other people in dealing with environmental issues in neotropics where, as we've already heard, a number of Canadian businesses are working and are not um, have a very good environmental record. So clearly there's a need for training uh, in relation to the Canadian context working in Latin America. So that program is best, as I've noted. We uh, have a website now. Now in this program, we have a number, we were only allowed 11 PIs, and so these are the, listing the PIs. We've expanded to University du Québec à Montréal and Laval University. And of course, Colin and Davikin are both members of this, uh, of this grant. We also have, of course, a bunch of STRI scientists. We have some more profs from other locations and departments. And in addition, as it's largely a requirement of the Canadian government for this program, we have a number of businesses. So these are Canadian companies working in Latin America, including mining companies. Now, these companies do not have any oversight of any sort over anything we're doing. Rather, they have committed to the idea that our program will train people who will potentially help them in dealing with environmental problems. So we have insight with them and we hope to interact with companies, but they have no control over anything that we do. Okay, so just to tell you what the program is in a nutshell, uh, I'll just read a couple passages from the grant that was funded. So 
Environmental change is occurring at an unprecedented rate, which has raised concerns about the conservation of biodiversity, the maintenance of ecosystem services, and the future of sustainability. These concerns are especially pressing in tropical environments where most of the world's biodiversity and humans reside and interact, and where natural resource extraction by Canadian companies is increasingly common. BESS will provide a multidisciplinary and immersive training experience that prepares the students, the next generation of environmental scientists. Now there's two key elements here. One is multidisciplinary and the other is immersive training. The multidisciplinary aspect of BESS, I, I, I just, talking so quickly, I feel like I need to apologize to the translators. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. But I'm, I'm, I'm coming up against the, the minutes that are being held up over here, so uh, something's going to have to give. Uh, the multidisciplinary aspect of BESS will be achieved through cooperation of a diverse group of co-applicants and collaborators who will administer and supervise complementary courses, internship rotation, and thesis research. So we have a whole bunch of different people uh, from a bunch of different, with a bunch of different areas of expertise that are contributing to the training of all the students in the program. The immersive aspect of BESS will be achieved through these activities taking place on the ground in Panama. So that's a continuation of the Neotropical Environment Option where all the courses are taught in Panama, internships are done in Panama, and most of the interactions occur in Panama. However, I would say about a third of the students are actually in working in other countries. Uh, and so these core aspects of BEST will be achieved through a partnership between Quebec uni universities and Panamanian institutions, particularly STRI. Uh, internships will also be possible with Canadian and Panamanian companies and organizations. So we have a program advisory committee, which represents a number of partners in the program. We have a program delivery committee. Now, I hate committees. I'm sure you guys all hate committees too. But governments that are deciding on these grants want to see committees. So we have committees. Now, one of the interesting things about these committees is we have no indigenous representation on these committees, and that is something that we would like to change. So we look forward to talking to folks about how best to include um, indigenous partners in this committees and in the programs. We have a number of research themes and you can see them here. They range from things that I do <laughs> down here to uh, things that are basic biological questions about biodiversity and also to um, areas that have social science components. Now, this cicada is focused on indigenous concerns, and so you might wonder, where does that play into this program? It plays in in three different ways. One is that many of the students who are natural sciences and doing pure biological research work in areas that are uh, indigenous territories. And so one of the important components of the program is to educate natural scientists in how to work better with indigenous communities, address problems of concern to them, and include their expertise when doing their research. In addition, there are some students in the program who focus specifically on um, working with indigenous communities. And so Colin and Davikin will, of course, be sending a number of students that way. And finally, our goal is to build true multidisciplinary collaborative projects around the idea of integrating natural and social sciences uh, from indigenous communities all the way up to governments, companies, and to research institutions. And so we look forward to developing these programs in the years to come. That's all I have. Um, so uh, for those who just arrived, we've just uh, changed the order. So uh, now the first panel on your paper. Um, with uh, the, the panel, um, the paper is about state conservation, uh, dispossession, safeguarding, and the Bugle uh, and Gabe territories of Panama. And um, uh, David Ken is going to introduce um, every uh, panelist, every uh, presenter uh, on this uh, paper. 12 minutes as well. Yes, of course. Yeah. And it'll be tough, but we'll make it. Good morning, and thank you for taking us in. Um, I'll get right into it. We think about Panama and we imagine uh, a canal, we imagine an enclave, uh, but the Isthmus nation is a strongly uh, indigenous nation. It's defined by indigenous peoples. 
uh, who occupy in this rather small country uh, close to over 20% uh, of the national uh, territory. Uh, there are seven different indigenous nations that stretch from uh, Colombia uh, to uh, Costa Rica. <coughs> the Wunan, the Embera, the Cuna, the Bugle, the Nobe, and the Teribe. Uh, together, uh, they have title over uh, through the form of comarcas, uh, title over uh, about 20% of the national uh, territory. McGill has a long-standing relationship uh, through Catherine Potvin with people and nations of the east of the country, the Embera uh, and the Cuna. But today, I want to introduce you uh, to people who are from the west, the Nobe and uh, the Bugle. Uh, so we have uh, three uh, guests uh, who will be speaking. Uh, Celestino Mariano Gallardo, who is a cacique, a regional cacique of the Comarca Nobe Bugle, which is uh, to the west, and two local authorities from an area that doesn't appear on your map, but is uh, occupied by Nobe and Bugle peoples, and they are uh, Saturni Saturnino Rodriguez, who is the cacique of that region, and Rosa Santander, who is the coordinadora or coordinator of the Women's Congress uh, of that area. And I'll let them speak in a moment. I just want to give a bit of background on the Nobe, the Bugle, and uh, their struggle and where they're at. The Nobe and the Bugle are uh, the composed um, sort of the largest uh, group in terms of population. Uh, there are approximately 200,000 uh, Nobe living inside the Comarca and uh, an estimated 100,000 who live outside uh, and a smaller number, about 16,000 uh, people uh, of the Bugle uh, nation. Their area of settlement is the Cordillera and the western, uh, sorry, the Atlantic coast of uh, the country. And this is the Comarca Nobe Bugle formed in 1996 and its different constituent uh, regions. So Celestino Mariano is the former cacique of the region of Nidrini, which is the, in the bottom um, left-hand corner. This area is uh, historically um, uh, been the object of a natural resource uh, grabbing uh, from the Christopher Columbus, actually raids these shores uh, in 1602, uh, and that story has continued to the present, most especially because of this. This is Cerro Colorado. It's the last remaining, the world's last remaining mega copper deposit. Uh, there are only 13 of these in the world. Uh, about three of them uh, are now exhausted. The last one to come online, uh, number 12, uh, just opened up two years ago in Mongolia. So the time uh, and attention, sorry, attention has been focused on exploiting this deposit since the 1970s. And I don't want to tell you, uh, time is short, but I just want to say that the important part of this is not only the story of the struggle of the Nobe and the Bugle to keep uh, mining companies out of the territory, but the way in which that struggle actually wove itself into the creation of the Comarca itself in 1996. It was part of the, the relations with the, the Panamanian government. The Panamanian government offered the Comarca as an, in exchange for opening uh, the, uh, the mine. The Nobe and the Bugle got the Comarca they still haven't given them the mine. In the negotiations for the creation of the Comarca in 1996, uh, on the table uh, was a larger region than what we see in the previous map. It is a, 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 a region that extends a further 60 kilometers uh, to the east, to the Belém River. Um, and uh, it, during those negotiation, negotiations at the last moment, uh, that section was cut out. Uh, and that is the area that our two guests, Rosa um, and Saturnino, uh, come from. Since the, um, 1996, uh, they have, uh, the Nobe and the Bugle in the, inside the Comarca have uh, det full determination rights. They have uh, their government oversees uh, allocation of lands amongst communities, within communities. Uh, there is an actual functioning internal government, but the challenges 
have ever since 1996 have been very strong. The actual uh, the obtaining the Comarca has not been a panacea or a final solution uh, for the Nobe uh, and the Bugle. This is just a, a bit of a, the way that the Comarca is seen as a caricature. This is the way the Comarca is seen uh, by people uh, interested in hydro projects in the Cerro Colorado, but also a number of gold uh, deposits inside, uh, inside that area. And this has led to uh, numerous con confrontations, quite serious ones, uh, most recently in 2011, 2012, uh, which led to serious confrontations between the Nobe and the Bugle and the Panamanian uh, security forces, uh, but also at the end of that process led to a law being passed that uh, prohibited mining inside uh, their territory. Um, the losses in terms of uh, the energy uh, and uh, actual f loss of life and injury uh, were quite high uh, over that period. Uh, the other element that I want to put on the table here before I turn the, 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 the things over to, to our guests um, is that a new Indian Act style law was imposed on the Comarca uh, recently, uh, which creates a new governance uh, system. It's the, the only one recognized by the Panamanian state, but it was imposed without consultation uh, with the existing authorities, and it's actually in violation of the laws that constituted the Comarca. Uh, back in 1996, it's seen as a means of dividing uh, the, the people of the, of the Comarca. And with that, I will turn it over in sequence uh, to Celestino Mariano, uh, Saturnino Rodriguez, and uh, Rosa Santander. Celestino. <coughs> Buenos días. Uh, desde la República de Panamá, Puente del Mundo, Corazón del Universo. Estamos tratando de reemplazar el término pueblos indígenas con el concepto de pueblos originarios. Eh, tengo a bien eh, hablarle eh, en parte de los antecedentes de la comarca en lo que se refiere a los pueblos nove bugle de, de Panamá un territorio o la gestión de un territorio delimitado con un nuevo régimen especial eh, esto se originó a raíz de la masacre eh, masiva y los despojos también de territorio masivo de nuestro territorio en nuestro país. Entonces, eso trajo consigo de nuevos movimientos en nuestro tiempo para lo que hoy tenemos eh, con marca Nove Bugle, que no fue muy fácil porque costó vidas, algunos compañeros murieron, que en paz descanse, y ahora pues eh, algunos gobiernos o figuras políticas que aspiran al gobierno, empezando desde nuestras comunidades, eh, se atreven a decir que gracias a un partido o gracias a un gobierno el pueblo tiene su comarca cuando realmente la gestión de la comarca fue esfuerzos de los pueblos sacrificio físicamente y hasta la vida que le costó a algunos compañeros sencillamente pues alguien quiere utilizar para fortalecer su politiquería los hechos reales que hemos conseguido hoy Ahora que tenemos la comarca, eh, nos, sentamos, nos estamos encontrando con otras experiencias nuevas. Eh, el gobierno pareciera que entendieron que nos hicieron favor de entregarnos un territorio delimitado 
y que a cambio de eso tenemos que aceptar la explotación de los recursos como lo que es la parte metálica, hídrica y también de los bosques, igual que los territorios. Pues el concepto de nuestros dirigentes y que algunos en paz descanse, eh, no era eso, sino obtener un territorio donde se respete sus bienes inmuebles y se respete sus disposiciones. Eh, también hay una nueva, estamos pasando una nueva, un nuevo escenario, es que el Ministerio de Ambiente de la República de Panamá eh, está buscando la manera inteligente, técnica, como acaparar territorio con los llamados parques nacionales, eh, área protegida y de esta manera quedarse nuevamente con parte de los territorios de la comarca, basándose de la estrategia técnica a través de las capacitaciones y las leyes. Entonces, frente a eso, pues, eh, nosotros estamos haciendo nuevos trabajos porque en base a las acciones hay nuevas reacciones de parte nuestra de enfrentar estos desafíos en donde estamos creando organismos de bases comunitarios en temas ambientales. Es lo que estamos haciendo para enfrentar los desafíos que nos trae la política torcida del Ministerio de Ambiente del Gobierno. No quiero decir con esto que estamos en contra de la conservación y la protección. Estamos muy de acuerdo con ese, ese título que maneja el ANAN, Ministerio de Ambiente, pero lo que no estamos de acuerdo es el despojo de nuestro territorio. Y los organismos de base que estamos constituyendo es para prever esta situación. Y eh, solo... Eh, nuestra misión sería entonces, a través de las organizaciones de base ambientales, eh, con, concientizar, coordinar, incorporar a las organizaciones de base existentes, a las instituciones lo locales, a las autoridades locales que se suman y sientan que es un deber y una responsable de la población buscar una política propia de conservación ambiental antes de que un particular como el ANAN venga a decir, yo te voy a cuidar a tu señora. Entonces, eh, dentro de nuestro objetivo es llegar a que nuestro pueblo tenga el equipamiento, tenga el conocimiento tecnológico y técnico para formular normas comunitarias ambientales basado en el patrón cultural de los pueblos, o es decir, de la forma de vida a como hemos vivido con nuestra naturaleza. Muchas gracias. Saturnino Rodríguez, cacique local del futuro distrito de Huracá. Buenos días. Mi saludo fraternal para todo el equipo organizador para las personas que han tenido que ver con toda esta organización. Quisiera detenerme saludando a todo el mundo, pero estamos limitados de tiempo. Eh, además de ser Panamá, corazón del universo, también ha sido visto como la tacita de oro. Yendo allá, eh, ciertamente, había una gran riqueza en Panamá, la que ya hoy no existe en la, en la ciudad capital. Ya eso ahora existe en las áreas de los pueblos indígenas. De ser así, entonces a nosotros nos queda un reto ahora de defender lo poco que hay. Exhortamos a todos este movimiento que se... Que se que se da cita en un sistema como de una red de comunicación y solidaridad con todas las necesidades que han sido planteadas. Sin embargo, ese reto eh, se debe doblar o multiplicar para puntualizar en la conservación, 
en todos los sentidos de nuestra, de nuestra vida, de tal manera que en estos momentos a mí me toca decir que en mi área necesitamos el apoyo técnico, el apoyo solidario en una propuesta legal, ya que existen varias opciones o puede ser para incursionar dentro de la ley 10 o puede ser con relación a la ley 72 puede ser un área anexa en conclusión es hacer una propuesta legal para la conservación y protección de todo el territorio representado en más de 6.000 personas que son nove bucle y campesinos en esa región. De esa forma, exhortamos a todo aquel equipo solidario para que nos apoyen y junto con ellos concretizaremos una propuesta legal para salvaguardar la tranquilidad, la paz y el derecho consuetudinario de esos pueblos que están allá en las riberas del país de Panamá. Con mucho más que decirle, le agradezco la atención y pueda que en otro momento podamos conversar un poquito más. Muchas gracias. Y Rosa Santander. Muy buenos días a todos los presentes de diferentes países. Eh, darle la gracia a Dios en prim primer momento por tenerme en este momento acá con ustedes. Eh, para compartir un poco sobre el trabajo de mapeo, el equipo tecnológico eh, que ha llegado en nuestra población para una arma más, para acompañar al pueblo, para trabajar con el pueblo. Nuestra región, como ya lo, lo repitieron, está fuera de una ley del derecho legal del pueblo indígena, por el cual hemos estado manteniendo nuestra lucha. Ahora estamos trabajando con un mapeo para trabajar con las comunidades, orientar a la población y concientizar de que los desarrollos que nos dicen en Panamá es mucho más eh, destruidores que nuestra población indígena ha conservado muchos años. Nuestra creencia, nuestra cultura es lo primero, nuestra, nuestra tribu se mantiene a proteger su naturaleza, por el cual... Eh, nuestra tarea con el mapeo es presentar a la mapa en las comunidades y así en esa forma también hablar sobre del territorio que ayer hablé sobre de las 13 concesiones mineras. Eh, como comisiones de trabajo nos hemos dado cuenta que hay 13 concesiones mineras en consulta con las comunidades después de haber creado en el 2002, 2001 y 2002 el Parque Nacional sin consultar con la población tienen visión del parque turístico sin consulta con la población y las titulaciones de tierra, que es un problema y un desafío para el pueblo Nuevo y campesino que quedaron excluidos de la ley 10 del 1997. Y es por eso le doy las gracias a todos ustedes para que nos apoyen como equipo solidario y aquí darle la gracia también a Colin Scott, a la Universidad de Maguil y a su equipo técnico como estudiante, esperamos mucho más apoyo de todos ustedes para cuando vamos a presentar nuestra propuesta en Panamá y contamos con ustedes. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a los compañeros de Panamá. Ahora seguimos. Uh, now we are uh, following the next uh, presentation. Um, okay. So um, next presentation is on redefining university research enterprises, partnership and collaboration in uh, Latshub Kitkala. Smoigat, 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 Smoigat Scott. 
Sigamana Legege Kaboalchuk. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about partnerships and collaborations between universities and indigenous communities. One forgets their age. <laughs> While forms of research collaboration have long been part of anthropological research, the power dynamics of such collaborations have typically remained unbalanced, tilted in the favor of <coughs> non-indigenous university-based researchers. However, with the growth of autonomous <coughs> indigenous research agencies and a modest expansion in indigenous fa research faculty, the power imbalance has begun to shift to greater equity. Our presentation today discusses in a little bit the UBC and Kakatla Nation's collaborative project and how we are contributing to redefining the university research enterprise. And we use these terms enterprise deliberately and with purpose. The specific partnership for which we're talking about emerged out of a long-standing research collaboration initiated in 2001. The salient features of our program are, one, a recognition of the need for multi-level permissions, administrative, hereditary, and individual, acknowledgement of community ownership of intellectual property, understanding that permissions are constantly in a process of negotiation, and finally, a fundamental principle that the authority and control over framework resides within the community. Our research collaboration has developed through an unsettling and an inversion of the normative frame and expectations of collaborative research. My own subject location as both Kikatla member, and for those who don't know, Kikatla is on the northwest coast of British Columbia. Uh, we are, as we like to say, within spitting distance of Alaska. That's how close we are. Uh, if you know the rock band 5440 and the slogan that we used to go with it, that's uh, about where we are in the western hemisphere. The mainstream narrative of collaborative research assumes non-indigenous researchers are at the core of the university research enterprise. Typically, the majority of university researchers studying our indigenous communities are, remain non-indigenous. This fact has focused the discussion of collaborative research toward consideration of the power of the researcher versus the presumed lack of power of the researched and debates over the presumed power of the anthropologist, we suggest to you reflect the ongoing and underlying colonial history of anthropology and cognate disciplines. At the same time, such a view, irrespective of its liberal values, presumes all studied communities lack power, authority, and the capacity to speak for themselves. Now, Butler's subject location as a non-Indigenous researcher working within Kikatla's research agency, Kikatla Environmental Monitoring, also complicates this normative model of collaboration. As an employee of Kikatla, she is bound to act on behalf of and under the direction of Kikatla in a way that I am not. Yet, nothing is simplistically binary. A current tension in our present work is finding the balance between academic research and the current priorities of the community. When I recently proposed an extension of my research in Kakatla's Alpine territories, Butler's response was, and what's in it for us? When assessing prospective research topics and projects, we ironically move, that's Caroline and myself, between subject positions. Butler is required to take the insider position as a GEM staff member, questioning the value of my particular academic proposal to Kikatla research priorities and community needs. One of her current roles in the collaboration is to look for ways to tie ongoing university-based research and occupancy research directly to the immediate needs of Kikatla Nation. This insider-outsider dynamic becomes somewhat muddled. 
And additionally, this exchange points out the fact that the nation is not passive in its acceptance of research proposals. Kikatla and GEMS is constantly barraged with requests from outside uh, to do all kinds of different types of research projects, everything that one might Im well imagine. <clears throat> I think, and we take a look at this particular image, this print here, we see an offshore wave coming into shore because Kikatla is on the extreme edge. Kikatla says that we stand on the outer shores, facing into the sea. This is a wave rolling on shore. You see the four clans of our people on the t rest in the crest on the top of the wave, and then encapsulated within the wave, halibut, herring, spring salmon, important resources. And there, standing upside down, is abalone, abalone that clings tenaciously, a mollusk that's also quite tasty, clings tena tenaciously to the cliffside, rocky shorelines of our coast, and holds on there. But note the upside down man the inversion, and we take the outsider and we place the outsider, the researcher, within us, inverted, upside down. The crest, the fifth crest for non-indigenous people is the butterfly, and the butterfly is always placed at the center of the, of the four crests, not because it's the most important, because as you know, butterflies are ephemeral beings that once they come out of their cocoon, last for a little bit, lay their eggs and die. The butterfly, though, because it needs to be protected and taken care of, is placed within the center. But here is this internal twist, this inversion, where the inside becomes outside, outside becomes inside, and we want researchers to invert their perspective and to stand on our shores and looking out, rather than coming on ships inbound studying us. And with that, I pass the floor to my colleague, Caroline Butler. Um, so this, this slide's image is the logo of Kikatla Environmental Monitoring, which is the resource management and research arm of the nation. And uh, our office is tasked with activating and facilitating internal and external research capacity. And so um, the, the next uh, key concept to collaborative research models that we'd like to turn on its head and rethink is capacity building. So basic to, to our ongoing methodology has been the understanding that university researchers and community researchers each bring something different to the table in terms of skills and knowledge. Um, but it's important that we don't fall into the trap of conceptualizing those as one-way streets that run in opposite directions in, the, in these collaborations. Um, the idea that capacity would run from university to community, transferring research skills to community members, and that knowledge would um, be channeled from the community to the, the university. So from a Kikala perspective, the nation has been building capacity at UBC um, for well over a decade. Through supporting the research activities of Charles, um, Kikatla has enhanced the career of a Kikatla anthropologist and has provided UBC with an indigenous academic with significant field exper expertise in publications. And for dozens of students, the experience working in Kikatla territory and directly engaging um, with com um, community members has provided them with the skills and the publications required to launch their careers in both academic and applied settings. So the capacity building is from, um, Kikatla is doing the capacity building. Um, and it's important to note that often Kikatla retains very little in terms of the direct capacity developed from the collaborative partnership on academic projects. The benefits to students and to the institution of UBC are greater often than the value of the reports to Kikatla. The more direct benefits to the nation come from the ability to leverage the power associated with Charles's academic credentials for Kikatla's engagement with government and industry. And um, a large part of that has recently been the um, bitter battle against Enbridge. So it must be, emphasize that this too is internal Kikatla capacity. Um, the biggest benefit of collaborative research is from Charles, 
who is Kit Katla and whose academic career has been directly supported by Kit Katla. So UBC just provides the credentials, or to extend our um, metaphor, the branding. Um, so for Kakatla community researchers, the direct benefit of research in terms of capacity building and knowledge acquisition also remains an internal process. So the researchers always emphasize how much they have learned from the projects, um, how it's changed how they understand their community and their history. But that's from interviewing their elders. It's not um, it's not from an engagement or a skills transfer from the university uh, researchers and the, and the graduate students. So the new skills that Kikatla researchers have acquired or enhanced through the collaborative projects are those related to training and teaching outsiders. Um, training them on protocol and etiquette, social relationships and responsibilities, and the methodological intricacies specific to research in La Cube Kikatla. The community sees itself as investing in the task of building capacity and enhancing skills by educating Kamsiwa or non-Indigenous staff like myself and other researchers. So it's important to emphasize that Kikala is not the passive and grateful recipient of academic research, but primarily a patient host of it. Um, and this is strategic. Um, academic research is a means to an end, which is often not actually the direct project of, of any particular research product, project. The overall research collaboration is of value to the nation, but not all aspects of it are of equal or even high value I'm on there, um, to Kikala. Kikala has chosen to engage in research projects and host field schools and summer students in order to build institutional expertise on Kikala culture and to establish a set of research, a set of relationships that allow Kikala to call on that expertise for its own purposes. So to conclude, the Kikatla UBC collaboration illustrates the evolving nature of community and university research relationships. Oh, thanks. Um, um, and the ways in which researcher positions, community policies, and the relative benefits of research are constantly shifting and renegotiated. The early collaborative research initiated by Charles was community-based, but has been empowered, uh, but has empowered Kikatla to move to a community-driven model. And as the partnership has become more established and the, co the commitment has allowed Kikatla to increasingly shape the research themes and products towards community priorities. Essentially, the, the relationship has developed in a way that has tr resulted in a truly co empowered collaborative model, where Kikatla even probes the focus and designs of Charles's projects. So Kikatla approaches all research with an evaluative lens, calculating whether the investment in the researcher and the contributions to the research are balanced by either a direct benefit in terms of the research products or a broader auxiliary benefit in terms of the greater relationship with UBC or another powerful institution. Kikatla is stress, thus strategic about research, evaluating the long-term and auxiliary benefits to collaboration. So our final slide, um, uh, shows abalone shells from a mid in Kishwan, one of the first sites of contact in Kikatla territory. And it's entitled Gugelkiansk, which um, translates many ways, almost done, um, but birthright, inheritance, and the process of passing on. Um, so these shells were dug up by Charles and it, because it was essentially demanded of him to become an archaeologist. Um, and this reflects Kikatla's research mandate directly from hereditary leaders to survey key village sites and harvesting sites to, and to document the use of abalone which Kikatla are now prohibited from harvesting. Because there was a strong desire for archaeological research in the territory, but a preference to keep it internal. And I, this is a great example of Kikatla demanding institutional and internal capacity to shift towards a Kikatla driven research agenda. So, just to, um, to sum up, uh, um, this is a case of a community essentially telling Charles to get on gumboots and a shovel and leave the, um, leave the recorders and um, other children behind and become a different kind of anthropologist um, and grab a shovel, which is a pretty significant shift. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you also for uh, keeping close to the time. Thank you. Um, 
So, uh, entonces ahora vamos a escuchar un comentario aquí de Herodia Silva, de la Universidad de Veracruz en México, un comentario de 3 a 5 minutos. Ok, buenos días. Eh, bueno, mucho gusto de estar aquí con ustedes y también eh, la facilidad de poder hablar en mi idioma. Eh, y, y para quienes están aquí visitándonos, eh, pues es una muestra de que pues estamos moviéndonos en un camino uh, apropiado que en diferentes momentos pues hemos visto que es como a largo plazo, eh, vamos avanzando lentamente, pero eh, pues vamos encontrando nuevos espacios para abrir la colaboración eh, incluyendo el, el lenguaje. Eh, bueno, el día de hoy eh, tuvimos tres presentaciones que abordan eh, temáticas que se han discutido a lo largo de estos días y que coinciden, hay coincide, coincidencias importantes con a, a algunos de los casos que se han presentado y a, bueno, hay, a, es increíble cómo estando en diferentes regiones del mundo eh, hay puntos de confluencia. Eh, por ejemplo, el caso de la eh, comunidad Ngobe Bugle, eh, tal vez algunos se identificaron con eh, esta eh, situación eh, radical de transformación del territorio en, en aras de la conservación, eh, desplazamiento de personas que habitaban estas regiones eh, por muchos años, por mucho tiempo, y um, la sobreexplotación eh, de los recursos que están ahí, los recursos mineros, hídricos de los bosques, eh, en aras de eh, pues la utilización de todos los recursos y del deterioro de la biodiversidad. Eh, bueno, ¿qué, ¿qué hacer? No? Hay como varias avenidas que se han planteado, y um, hay dos dimensiones o tres tal vez o más, pero bueno, ahí puedo eh, capturar tres diferentes dimensiones. Eh, la importancia de nuestro posicionamiento ético-político en nuestra eh, ocupación cotidiana, que es, eh, muchos somos investigadores eh, eh, y estamos en conexión con eh, problemáticas locales que no nada más son de eh, pueblos originarios, de grupos indígenas, sino que también implican nuestra supervivencia planetaria, nuestro eh, eh, pues, sostenimiento de la vida, de nuestro modo de vida en el largo plazo. Entonces, son eh, problemas que nos implican a todos, por lo tanto, tiene que haber un planteamiento eh, de, de raíz, como algunos de los eh, compañeros de las organizaciones socias han planteado. Eh, estamos en una posición actual en la que eh, estamos en la era del antropoceno, en donde el paisaje ha sido transformado en los últimos 50, 60 años, eh, y entonces nos vemos en la necesidad de eh, repensar nuestro papel eh, como investigadores y cómo estamos realizando la investigación. Alguien mencionaba que eh, hemos repetido y repetido la misma fórmula muchas veces y seguimos cometiendo errores, por lo tanto, bueno, um, conviene preguntarse por qué cómo y cuál es el propósito de nuestra actividad. Eh, hay ejemplos interesantes como el de las dos iniciativas específicas del de programa de NNSERC, um, CREATE, en donde ya se ve ese, esa nueva perspectiva desde las ciencias biológicas que hace tal vez todavía una década no era eh, tan prácticamente pensable en donde empezar a ver esa apertura a incorporar eh, de una manera concreta eh, la eh, función y el papel que tienen los investigadores en las comunidades y cómo se relacionan con la gente que habita en estos sitios. 
Eh, por tanto, bueno, es un reto, ¿no? Pero eh, me parece que estamos en ese, en ese eh, camino en donde pues habrá que generar eh, nuevas formas de hibridizar el conocimiento, eh, las metodologías, de ser uh, más abiertos, eh, de que haya una pluralidad en cuanto a la forma como estamos eh, extendiendo estos puentes de conocimiento. Y el ejemplo de eh, Kit, uh, Kit, Kit Kala, Is that how you? Kit Kala, Kit Kala uh, de la nación Kit Kala, eh, creo que es un, comple un ejemplo muy complejo, complejo y muy interesante porque van más allá de asumirse como eh, quienes tienen el conocimiento en la forma eh, occidental, tradicional, eh, y um, pues se ubican en, un, en una frontera en donde, eh, como lo señala Charles um, y, y Catherine, um, eh, se busca mayor igualdad en cuanto a la forma como se van generando estos nuevos conocimientos y estas eh, nuevas formas de reconocernos, de eh, posicionarnos con respecto a las otras personas, que es la eh, corriente latinoamericana, la, la otra edad, ¿no? cómo nos identificamos nosotros y cómo eh, aceptamos eh, nuestra, eh, nuestras debilidades, no nada más nuestras fortalezas, sino también nuestras debilidades y nuestras eh, posibilidades de también ser parte de un diálogo y de un aprendizaje que no nada más es en una dirección, sino va en eh, ambas direcciones. Eh, hay diferentes escalas y bueno, pues nuevamente se habla, eh, los, eh, los compañeros de la comunidad Ngobe Bucle hablan de la importancia de las redes de intercambio, eh, de la importancia de la comunicación, de que fluya esa solidaridad, eh, no nada más entre grupos sur-sur, sino también norte-sur, como lo estamos haciendo en este momento. Eh, anoche se hablaba también de eh, lo, lo valioso que es tener las experiencias en el lugar y uh, verse y, y experimentar cuando sea posible estas redes de intercambio que en Latinoamérica y también eh, en, el, um, en el ámbito de la agroecología, que es una corriente que está fluyendo a nivel internacional a través de la eh, vía campesina, eh, que utiliza metodologías como de campesino a campesino, en donde eh, se da un intercambio eh, directo sobre problemáticas eh, específicas que están pasando personas de diferentes comunidades del mundo y que coinciden entre sí, eso es lo, lo increíble. Eh, y bueno, cómo esto se refleja en el marco eh, de legislación y en, en las leyes, las leyes van como muy lentas y um, pues es otra tarea importante que tenemos como, como grupos en eh, colaboración, eh, cómo nos eh, posicionamos en cuanto a este marco de legislación que nos eh, permite y que nos abre o no esas oportunidades para hacer efectivas acciones prácticas y concretas que deriven no nada más en el bienestar de eh, las comunidades de los pueblos originarios, sino que también van a repercutir en nuestro propio bienestar. Thank you. Gracias, merci beaucoup. Thank you, everyone. Miigwech. Um, so we're um, running a bit late, but we've been doing not so bad with the time. So we have about, I would say, 20 minutes, 20 minutes for questions. Yes. So I'll take. Probably I'll take one, uh, take two questions to start, and the panelists can answer, and I'll take more questions. We on any question we see, and we have another question there. My uh, question is addressed to Monsieur Charles Menzi or Caroline Butler. Okay. Uh, 
Euh, en fait, j'en aurais deux, si vous êtes capable de le temps de répondre aux deux. Comment vous faites, comment vous vous y prenez pour suivre les projets de recherche qui, sont, euh, qui vous sont soumis? Et euh, quel, que, comment vous faites pour protéger les données sensibles? Quelle méthode vous utilisez ou quels moyens vous utilisez pour euh, protéger les données sensibles? And we have another question there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me stand so that uh, you can see me. Uh, my questions are more like a comment, but also a question. I appreciate the role of research. My interest is in the interface between research, policy, and practice. I believe that research that cannot transform into practice really is just another way of... Uh, my question is, is uh, to what extent has the information that you have generated transformed the, the lives of indigenous peoples? That's one. The other question is collaborative research. How would you engage, how do you select your research subjects? Do you feel that the community has, like, the, community has the capacity to negotiate with you, the research institutions, in saying, yes, this is a subject that we want. Uh, how does this process engage with issues in the other discourse about indigenous peoples, the core questions of free, prior, informed consent? How do you, uh, how do you link, who do you, who do you, uh, who, who do you sign a contract with? Is it a chief, is it a, 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 a tribal authority, and, uh, and then the other thing is, and to we making communities research captives? Are, are you not sensing a question whereby communities are, uh, communities are fatigued with research? Before I was born, I think Professor Galati was still doing research. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, and then the other thing is, don't you, what, how does, the, how does interaction with the communities impact on you as a researcher? How does it affect to you that the Maasai are still struggling with their lives and uh, you, are, uh, you feel you are powerless? You know so much information about the Maasai, yet you can't do, you can't do much. Do you, do you sometimes, uh, the relief workers sometimes suffer from post-trauma stress disorder. What do researchers, what is the problem with researchers? Do you encounter, do you feel impacted negatively by research? Uh, sorry for the time and then, and then the other thing is, researchers occasionally have been accused of being, uh, 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 of being uh, exits or entries into the world of bipartisan stealing knowledge. How do you respond to this? Thank you. I just wanted to respond to a couple things and then Caroline will have another, some stuff and some other comments. Um, there's a lot of questions there that would take uh, a long series of discussions over some kind of liquid and food and for most of the day and weekend, the rest of the next week. I think the primary thing I'd say is that you have to, each community is different. And in Kikatla, uh, there is for a long time a protocol of multiple levels of permission. It's, it's not simply that we've got a, that one has to get a signed agreement from the band council and a band council resolution saying, oh yeah, we have an agreement with you. But there is the administrative level there is a hereditary level, and for people who might have to understand, Kakatla is a heavily ranked society in which there are people who have particular rights to speak and others who don't, and so that also plays into the process. And then there is an individual level of consent. So it's a multiple, multi-layered 
interactive context in which there's different types of permissions, and this is nothing new. You can dig into the anthropological archives and find examples in which earlier researchers found themselves halfway through a series of interviews when the person's up, oh, that's it, uh, I gotta go talk to the chief. And it goes in that direction to get permission. Uh, and there's that process. Um, in terms of transformation, I think one of the peri the moment of research today is about is not about so much transforming the individual lives of members in Kikatla as ensuring that Kikatla has a capacity to continue into the future and that future generations can continue to be Kikatla in whatever that might mean for be for being Kikatla. Uh, the current state of resource development and extraction is such that the really moving to the final moment of exclusion and erasure from the landscape and from any meaningful ownership. And so I think that is really the point of view. I think we could talk in the longer version of the paper and Caroline has discussed that individual transformations of people engaged in doing research with us. Um, and I'm going to just stop there. Yeah. Um, uh, it, I, I do want to add one little thing thing about um, how, how the research Im impacts or changes the lives of Indigenous people. And I think um, in our office we try to find multiple uses for, for all research and try to find products that um, are useful, but also we try to find products that delight community, which because of the research fatigue, um, which is tremendous right now, um, we're look we're always looking for ways to take some of the drier material and turn it into something that people are excited about. And so we've used um, old uh, interviews um, to pull out um, children's stories um, and translate there. So they're in Somaliac. Um, the Kekatla language uh, and uh, using them for curriculum, but they're, they're ri rich stories about the lives of uh, elders or recently deceased elders living on the land. And so as a product that actually came out of a very academic um, research project on um, environmental knowledge, it, uh, it's something that people can hold in their hand and see themselves in and are illustrated by uh, children in the school and Kikala artists, and so we're, we're always trying to find another way. Charles has developed curriculum out of some of the uh, uh, like actual curric curriculum out of that. So um, we try and find these simple but um, pleasing uh, products that I think, you know, on a daily pe basis, people can see something happening out of out of research. But um, I just wanted to respond to the question about following the research projects and uh, and how we protect the data. And um, we, we've actually really had to tighten that process up recently um, because of the barrage of offers, which is exciting as well as daunting, um, and expanding the collabor co collaborations um, broader than UBC and Charles. And so we've had to go from a more informal um, process to a, a, to a formalized uh, ag research protocol agreements, and then also position our office um, as st for stick handling and facilitating both internal research by other Kikatla departments, but also by out outside institutions. So we've developed very tight research agreements, which actually have recently horrified um, some <laughs> um, potential research part partners um, from universities about the, con the control the community is hoping for over um, over publications and. Uh, and then we also uh, think very carefully about what data is going to what partners and in what in what form, and have actually very legal um, agreements about about that because we are in um, living constantly in the shadow of litigation and uh, other other complicated processes. So it's very it's very tight and formal now. So the program that I coordinate uh, is, of course, at a different scale than some of the other projects have been talked about. 
ours is not really a project, ours is a collection of projects. So we're a scholarship program that gives money to all sorts of different levels of investigation. And that makes us see a whole bunch of different types of questions that are being addressed and therefore different issues with respect to uh, data protection. And I just wanted to um, make a comment on something that I've been reflecting on as a natural scientist coming and thinking about a bunch of the projects that I usually see and then listening to the um, initiatives and projects here. And that is that a divide that's quite interesting uh, for me is that there's a number of projects in our program that are not about the indigenous peoples, First Nations, original peoples. Instead, those projects are focused on the non-human aspects of the environment, so biodiversity in particular. And so in those cases, the interactions with indigenous peoples are focused on gaining insight into the biodiversity through the lens of the people that live with the biodiversity. And so in that sense, the goal is not the uh, issues of interest to indigenous peoples, but rather how we can get help from indigenous peoples. The other side is mainly what we're hearing about in most of the things here, where the focus really is on uh, issues of importance specifically to indigenous peoples. And, and so those those two different streams or tracks of investigation, I think, lend themselves to very different sorts of uh, issues with respect to data management, but also with respect to how we choose our projects and then how we interact with the communities. So in our particular case, those sorts of decisions are made on a project-by-project -project basis rather than a top-down approach from uh, NEO or from BESS. Instead, these are arrangements that are made between individual researchers and institutions and communities. So I think that in, there's no one size fits all answer to these sorts of problems and that uh, certainly in our program they're treated on a case by case basis where um, as the administration of the program itself we really only provide oversight when there's any sort of uh, issues that can't be solved on one on one conversations between the parties that are involved in a particular project. Sí, para responderle a, un, a la segunda pregunta, eh, en cuanto al tema de que algunos investigadores, investigadores sea la puerta de entrada o salida política, eh, no sé si estoy claro que se refiere a la política partidaria, pero en nuestra región ya eh, estamos invadidos del sector político, y esto gracias a que las propias comunidades eh, son las que eh, llevan a estas figuras y son identificadas, pero lo miramos como eh, algo eh, muy aparte de lo que nosotros entendemos de un trabajo técnico de parte de los investigadores. Eh, lo único que sí quiero explicar es eh, que dentro de nuestro territorio o nuestros pueblos originarios eh, se han dado experiencias eh, o dos tipos de experiencias y en base a eso eh, los pueblos eh, están eh, tomando una nueva eh, forma de trabajar igual que la dirigencia de los pueblos eh, eso eh, consiste en que con qué propósito o intenciones llega eh, un investigador en la área y con quién se coordina pues en la parte nuestra consideramos que no tenemos problemas con los investigadores, no hay aburrimiento, voy a decir un término así casi parecido a lo que utilizó el compañero, no miramos como algo necio, sino para nosotros es algo oportuno, por, eh, siempre cuando va eh, basado en los en los momentos, las situaciones, el vivir y el sentir de los pueblos sobre los impactos negativos que está recibiendo. Entonces, en base a ese tema, si un investigador llega a la región, es, eh, 
beneplácitamente de bienvenido y recibido para que haga los trabajos. Cuando me referí en antes de, de que hay investigaciones o investigadores con propósito o eh, otras iniciativas, otras intenciones, es porque a veces eh, se han dado investigaciones en materia de antropología, biología, arqueología, que lo han hecho eh, sectores que van de afuera sin la coordinación con la dirigencia de la comarca o que han sido contratados por otros sectores no, no originarios para que haga el trabajo de tesis y que esta entonces no responde a un compromiso con las comunidades porque después se van y no sabemos más nada. Entonces ese tipo, ese ejercicio de trabajo técnico de los investigadores es lo que deja un vacío en la comarca cuando no hay un seguimiento en base a los trabajos. Pero tenemos buenas experiencias de investigadores en esa materia que han coordinado con la dirigencia y al mismo tiempo es importante saber de que exista una, un equipo base en las comunidades eh, que pueda seguir o que sea el fuerte de coordinación y seguimiento a un trabajo técnico realizado por los estudiantes o investigadores, como el caso de hoy, ahora tenemos organizaciones ambientales comunitarias que serían el fuerte para el trabajo y coordinación con cualquier eh, técnico o investigador que vaya al área a hacer estudios de investigación, ya sea para llenar su tesis o también que sirva de base también para instrumento nuestro sobre los problemas que tenemos políticamente con el gobierno en materia ambiental y tenencial. Así que eh, ese es la, el, el escenario que encontramos por ahora en nuestro territorio de los pueblos originarios. Gracias. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we are running out of time. If we want to have a lunch on time, I think we should uh, finish this panel. If you have uh, more questions, you can ask to the uh, different panelists. And uh, before uh, the recess, uh, I want to uh, say something. So, je trouve important aussi de, de rappeler qu'on est sur le territoire Atikamekw dans une salle qui s'appelle Nouvelle France qui vante les, les, la vertu de, de la colonisation française sur le territoire Atikamekw avec ce que l'on discute aujourd'hui, le panel qui parlait bien sûr de, de partenariat et d'apprendre de la part des autochtones. Je trouvais que c'était important de rappeler qu'on n'est pas juste sur le territoire des Atikamekw mais on est également euh, entouré de propagande colonialiste. Donc euh, je voulais euh, vous souhaiter une bonne pause avec ceci.